In part two of our discussion on diffusion of innovations, we'll talk about things like the speed of adoption and how the most optimal standard is not necessarily the one that gets adopted and why that can happen. We'll look at an example of that as well. So first, let me ask you a question from your readings. What is the degree to which something is perceived to be better than what it replaces? Is that relative advantage, compatibility, complexity, or trial ability? I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. The degree to which something is perceived to be better than what it replaces is relative advantage. We'll talk about relative advantage as well as compatibility, complexibility, and trial ability as product characteristics that affect the speed of adoption. So the first of those is the relative advantage. And relative advantage deals with two things. It deals with price and it deals with performance. So as we can see at the bottom of the screen, what's the relationship between value and price? Well, the performance has to be high if the price is high in order for us to think that we're getting a good value. If the price is low, we'll normally accept a little bit less performance and still consider it a good value. So relative advantage that we perceive is one thing that affects the speed of adoption. Another is compatibility. Are we able to use the new device the new innovation with other things we already have. So if we can interface it with things we already have and not have to adopt a brand new system, that can affect the speed of adoption by increasing it. Also, complexity is something that can change the speed of adoption. If we have something that's very complex, the average consumer is going to be less likely to adopt it and is going to wait until they have a lot of resources in terms of companies or in terms of opinion leaders that can help them use it. Another thing that affects speed of adoption is trialability. And I had an experience with this a couple of years ago when the Guitar Hero games were first coming out. My friend had told me it was a great game and I should buy it, but it was really hard to play it because you couldn't rent it because it came with a special guitar controller. And every time I went to Best Buy to try to use the demo display, there was always somebody else playing it, so I never got the chance to use it. So my trial ability was very limited, and because it was more expensive than the normal games for the types of video game systems that, that you would purchase it for, I couldn't buy it without trying it first and feel good about that. I couldn't feel like the value was good. So if you're able to try something first, it can affect the speed of adoption. Think about buying a car. Have you ever bought a car without taking it for a test drive first? Most people haven't, so the idea of trial ability is the same idea that you would use to test drive a car. You want to see if you can use it to determine if you like it. Finally, observability or communicability affects the speed of adoption. Can you see it in practice? Can you communicate about it? If so, the adoption of an innovation usually goes more quickly. So now that we've looked at what affects the speed of adoption, let's think about some inventions and see if they've become institutions yet. One is high definition television. And this is one in the last couple of years that you've started to see more and more, partially due to the switch coming in February of 2009, where all televisions will have to be able to receive digital broadcasts. And high definition TV, while not the same as digital, has been linked with that. So high definition TV has taken a while to succeed because while the performance is very good, the price has been high. And so you've seen innovators and early adopters begin to adopt it. Now the chasm is starting to be crossed. Another innovation was the video laser disc. And this was a DVD-like object that came out before the DVD did. One of the problems with this, though, and the reason why you don't see it around anymore, is that it was inconvenient. You would have to use usually four of these discs, or two two-sided discs, to get an entire movie on. So you would have to be changing the disc halfway through the movie. So this technology went by the wayside and what we saw later were video CDs and DVDs. Now the video CDs were more popular overseas, specifically in Asia, than they ever were here because we went straight to DVDs here and about the only video CDs you'll see nowadays are those used for karaoke. But DVD did succeed, overtook videotapes is now the dominant medium for watching movies at home, but that will soon be overtaken by Blu-ray. 
Another innovation is operating systems for computers. And we've seen the open source Linux and OSS for Mac, OS X for Macintosh compete with Windows, but they haven't been able to overtake Windows yet. Now OS X recently has cut into market share for Windows, but they are still not the dominant forms, even though their users swear by them and say they are better than Windows. One final innovation to think about is electronic online banking. And this has taken so long to succeed, or it's taken so long for people to go to this as a primary form of banking, because people tend to be concerned about money. And that's something that they may not trust electronics with as well, especially those in the late adopters uh, category of the laggards. So let's think about some tipping points for some competing technologies. We had a tipping point that caused color TV to become the dominant type of television over black and white TV. Back in the early 80s, before DVDs, we had video recording and we had two competing formats. The one that won out was VHS. It defeated the Betamax videotape. We've also seen PC platforms. We saw Apple versus IPM MS-DOS and IBM MS-DOS, now Windows, were the platform that took over. Even though Apple is making a comeback now, the tipping point already occurred. It's possible another tipping point could occur in the future. The way this one is different is usually when a tipping point occurs, the competing technology goes out of business, like Betamax or black and white TVs. Finally, think about keyboards. If you look at the keyboard in front of the computer that you're currently viewing this on, you'll notice that the keys are arranged in a pattern called QWERTY, which means the top row is Q-W-E-R-T-Y. There was another keyboard standard that came out called Dvorak, and there was a battle between these two to be the innovation for keyboards. QWERTY, QWERTY versus Dvorak was something that came out of an interesting problem. In, 19, in 1867, the Scholes Primitive Typewriter had a type bar clash problem. If you look at the picture of the typewriter here, you can see that each key is linked to a different vertical type bar, and those would hit through a ribbon and put letters on the paper. Well, if you type too quickly, one would not retract all the way before another one would go to type the word on the paper, and so they would get caught. So the QWERTY keyboard was actually designed to slow down typing. And so in the 1890s, the QWERTY four-row keyboard became dominant as the innovation. And if you look here, we can see the Dvorak keyboard is laid out differently. If you look at the middle row, you see all the vowels there underneath the left hand, and then under the right hand are the most commonly used consonants. And so if you do a keyboard comparison at this website, www.siteuri.ro slash Dvorak, you'll see that no matter what you type in, the Dvorak is going to result in fewer fewer reaches for you from the middle row to the top or bottom row for your fingers, and it's probably going to allow you to type more quickly than the QWERTY system. However, the lock into the op optimal standard took place because the QWERTY keyboard did what it needed to do at the time, and now it's so ingrained as the innovation that Dvorak can't challenge it. Analog HDTV was developed in Japan, but it was now abandoned due to the superiority of digital. And it's possible that the U.S. television standard of NTSC versus the European standard of PAL may have some different advantages. And it's possible that one is better than the other, but the different standards are already locked in. So as we can see here, small historical accidents, such as the type bar clash problem, can tip adopters to choose a standard that later is perceived as non-optimal, such as QWERTY versus Dvorak. So now we have seen some product characteristics that affect the speed of adoption and diffusion of innovations, and we've seen how some innovations get chosen to be the ones that we use, even though they're not the optimal ones.